It is Wednesday afternoon, June 26th, half of our year gone. Wow, yeah. good thing we're here together because time is short. <laughs> we're picking up in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 45. Technically, we're picking up at verse 9. What we have is a wonderful time to focus on here. We've come through a lot, but this is a time of excitement. Yosef, second only to Pharaoh in Egypt, has now excuse me, revealed himself to his brothers and he's let them know that they can come down and live in Egypt uh, under him and be safe and be fed at the time of famine. He also, of course, immediately requested to know whether his father was still alive. That's the big thing on his agenda now. He tells his uh, um, brothers who are going to go home, you know, he's sending them home with the food that they need, but he's telling them, hurry up, go, and don't delay. Get your dad, get your little brother, well, yeah, sorry, get your dad and come on down, the families, you know. So it's an exciting time. Let me just say again, three times prior to this verse of hurry up and go, Yosef has declared, you didn't send me down to Egypt. You're not the one. God was in control. And we want to remember that. Even when evil is done to us, it does not mean that God is not in control in your life. Let that encourage you. Our trials and tribulations, tests to, to testimonies, messes to messages. God is at work in it all. God had ordained and planned to put Yosef into this position where he could be, and I'm putting it in a small, not a capital, and in quotes, a, a, a savior in essence to the Jewish people. You know, the same way that we'll say to somebody, oh, you saved my life, okay? I'm not calling him the Savior, but what a beautiful picture of the Savior, capital S, that we've seen in Yosef's life as we've gone through, I think we've hit 80-some points of the comparison between his life and Yeshua's. Um, I love the way Spurgeon had said it. He says the two things meet in practical harmony, the free will of man and the predestination of God. People struggle with this all the time. I'm going to tell you it's two sides of a coin. You can't have a coin without two sides. It's not a coin. Do we fully understand? No. When we look at the heads, we're understanding the head. When we look at the tails, we're trying to understand the tail. But to understand fully and to see the complexity, to try to put God on our human level with our little peon brains, at least mine's pea-sized, <laughs> we can't. But God does give man free will to choose. He doesn't make man a puppet, and at the same time, man's choice doesn't detour God's perfect will. That's amazing, that's my God. That's worthy of his praise. And as he went on to say Spurgeon, he said, man acts just as freely and just as guiltily as if there were no predestination. He's doing, and even like the brothers are thinking, we did this, it's our fault. You know, this is what's being said, but God ordains, God arranges, God supervises, and God overrules just as accurately as if there were no free will, as if it was all staged puppets, but it's not, because that's our God. He can take what's meant for evil, turn it for good, and he does know all the things that are going to go on, and I didn't silence my phone, so anyone else who needs to take the moment to silence the phone. The alarm you just heard is the reminder to pray for the hostages for their release from Israel, it, from Israel, from Gaza, forgive me, to Israel. Get them home, Lord, into Israel. But that's uh, that's an everyday reminder, and it, just at this moment in your heart, just pray for the release of the hostages. Pray for the testimony to come out of God's hand well, to provide protection. They yes, the ones who who were hostages even for a short or a long time. There's a whole long ways of recovery. Plus, there is for all the families. There is for the rebuilding. There, it's it's every level: emotional, physical, spiritual, um, mental. What did I leave out? So yes, huge, huge, huge. But that's my God is big enough to be able to, to bring that kind of healing on every level. So. Okay, so in verse 9, he's saying to his brothers, Now therefore, oh, that's, sorry, that's a hurry. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son, Yosef. Now, remember, dad thinks Joseph is dead. He's thought that for over 20 years, probably about 22 years now, if our timing is completely accurate in Scripture. 
this is going to be a, a total more than eye opening. What do I call it? The whole everything's going to go upside down. Yeah. To, First of all, yes, yeah. yes, There's and you've got to be well. thinking. <laughs> what are they going to tell Dad? You know, they. Joseph has now found out that Dad thinks he was killed by a wild animal. What's going to happen? We don't get a whole lot of that, but he just tells him, you know, that that let let him know that this is I am who I'm saying I am. You know, this is not a fairy tale. This is not somebody pulling wool over your eyes. No, they're they're convinced they know this is their their brother, the one that they had sold into slavery. But he isn't telling his brothers, you go home and tell dad what you did. <laughs> He's not taking on that battle. He put that into God's hands long ago. We see that and he trusts God in that. But he's just saying, bring my father. Um, and he says, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. Don't, hurt, don't take your time, hurry up, get down here. It's safe here for you because I'm in position of leadership. That's what he means by Lord. He doesn't mean capital L. He just means one that is in authority who can bring them in because this is going to be contrary to everything that they know. Yaakov is, thinks that he needs to stay in the promised land. Remember when Yitzhak was headed down to Egypt, God stopped him at Gerar and said, don't go, and said he would be with him. So we're going to have to see a whole, like you said, the whole world is going to be upside down from this. But he's trying to assure the, them, you know, tell that, tell me you're right from my mouth. Tell them to come. It's good down here for them to come. And he tells them that. He says, take good care of them. Yes, and this is how good he's going to take care of them. Verse 10, you shall live in the land of Goshen. Now, Goshen was about 40 miles from present day Cairo. It's an area about 900 square miles. It's situated in the delta of the Nile. So it was this, the area, the, this section, this whatever I call it on the map, it, it was the best land for herds and flocks. And what are Jacob's and the people? Shepherds. Remember, they've got cattle, they've got livestock. So this is perfect for them. And cherry on top, it was near On, O-N, the city that remember Yosef's wife was the daughter of the priest of On. So this this area where it's false worship, they're not gonna move into On, but they're going to be close, okay? They're close. Now, if you haven't seen your son and your father in 20 plus years and you had a close relationship, you don't want 200 miles between you where you can't hardly see each other. Yosef is saying, I can bring you down put you in this land that's ideal for your shepherding, for your, you know, to continue on with all that you need and you'll be close to me. And I can guarantee you the path between On and, or where, you know, from Pharaoh's palace, wherever Yosef was, to his dad, back and forth, I'm sure, was going to be well-traveled. I just thought when they, when they talked to the dad, He's not going to be upset, so, so go ahead. let's go. Exactly. Figure out the details later, how this happened, what happened. Not, you know, that isn't what matters. I think he he would also, his heart, it's going to skip a beat at first, and then it's like, let's go, you know. Yeah. i got to see for myself. I want to put my own arms around him. I want to feel that, you know. Yeah, I think so. But Yosef is trying to tell him, look, hey, it's good. Come on down. Remember, they the brothers can still be feeling that, is he going to want revenge on us? Because we know they never quite let go of that fear. We'll see that pop back up too. So verse 11 says, There I will also provide for you, for there are still five years of famine to come, and you and your household and all that you have would be impoverished. He's saying, hey, I know they can't live there. I know that they can't make it five more years up in Israel. They've got to come down here where I can tend to their needs, where I can feed them and can take care of them. So remember, they don't know that the famine's going to go five more years. Yosef is speaking prophetically because he was given that ability to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And he's hit the nail on the head. All the land of Egypt saw seven years of plenty, just like Yosef said the dream meant. And now they're in the second year of famine. So I think by this point, they're all convinced it's going to be seven years. But has that word gone all the way up to Israel? Probably not likely. You know, it's, it's not like they had telephones and they were 
talking to each other, you know. They'd been cut off from what's happening down in Egypt. They didn't even know Yosef was down in Egypt. But here is where his knowing that, he knows, I, I, well, he wants to see his dad, period. But he also doesn't want to leave him for five years in famine. Yes? I saw just three things in that year to me. God's presence here to us, provider, our provider. And then the five years is years of grace. Are going to be covered by grace? Have you read my notes? <laughs> is it Bible the Holy? College. Is it the Holy Spirit bringing me to both of us and Bible College? Great, yes. But yeah, you are absolutely right on track, and I will be bringing out those points. But I love that you did already. That's great, right on target. And and that's what we love about the Word of God is we can dig into it and find all these you know depths, all these different. I love to say it's like the diamond. You just brought out the ruby, and I'm bringing out the sapphire, and somebody else will bring out the setting of gold, and nice. what a beautiful picture we get. But uh, Yosef did have the means to provide for them. Um, he knew that they needed to be sheltered, and this is God's will, because we're going to see a small number come down, and we're going to see them become a very strong and mighty nation. So God is at work. He promised this, this continuation to Avram, to Yitzhak, to Yaakov, and it's, we're going to see it right away, right here, right now. So, verse 12, I believe that he's adding these words on just to, you know, the clincher, the con complete convincer. Behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see. That is my mouth which is speaking to you. He's saying to them, look, it's not hearsay. You're not dreaming this, and you didn't get told by somebody who, you know, oh, that's too good to be true. And remember, we're always told, if it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. So he's saying, no, you're getting it right from my mouth. You're seeing me. My brother Benjamin is seeing me. You've seen me saying it. You know this is true. This isn't a lie. It isn't a trap. It isn't false. So convince your... your Benjamin did go down there to yeah. see his brother. Yeah. Yes. And to bring him back. Yes. Yes. Remember, he, the goblet was in Benjamin's bag. Oh, and they came down, they all returned to Egypt because Benjamin was supposed to be, you know, on, on, called on the carpet for it, but they didn't let him go alone. So he's there with them, you know, and that was only after Jacob finally gave him up because they were hungry, because there was a need. But, uh, but he's, and, and you can see what's coming, and I know it, that's why I'm fighting for what I say. Let me just stay in track. I'll say more about Benjamin, Benjamin in just a moment. Um, now, you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt. Tell him how good it is for me here. Tell him what I've got here. All that you've seen, you must hurry and bring my father down here. He wants them to make sure they make clear to, his, to their dad, there's no reason to not do this and every reason to do it. I can back up my words. You've seen it. You've seen my control. You've seen the food. <laughs> The, the feast I gave you, you've seen all that I gave you to go with, you know, all the, the clothing, everything. Remember, Benjamin got five times as much as everybody else. Mm -hmm. You've seen all this splendor. Tell my dad. Tell my dad. Come on down. It's good down here. You know, we, you, you just need to come. And then here you go. This is where I, I know. He realizes he's going to have to let go of his little brother. And there had to have been that. He, he loved all his brothers, obviously. But that, that little bit of kinship, because they're two from the same mom and dad, that little bit of, you know, specialness in there. So in verse 14, and he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck, and he wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. I just see brother and brother just hugging. Just don't even want a moment of separation. But Benjamin's got to go home, because otherwise if Yaakov sees them coming and Benjamin is not there, that could be the end of him right there on the spot. Remember, they even told Yosef that when the test was, was on, what they were going through, that uh, um, if he, Yuda said it, if I don't return with, you know, bring Benjamin back, it'll be the, the end of, of my dad. So, uh, but all this, all this splendor, all this glory, go and show it in whatever way, say it, tell it, so that dad won't be afraid to come. You know, just go. And then he kissed all his brothers. See, he cared about all of them. He wept on them. I'm sure it was hard to let go. And afterward, his brothers talked with him. I find that very, very interesting. He embraces them. He's loved them. 
Remember when he first revealed himself? They couldn't even speak. They were just speechless, just shocked, speechless. I think it's began to set in now. It's began the reality and that there's a change here and that there's a genuine love from Yosef toward them. They're beginning to let down that guard of fear. He's sending them away with plenty of goods, telling them, come on back down. Now they're beginning to relax in his presence. And I can only imagine what that conversation was. They had 20 years to make up for, you know. I'm sure that, that they're wanting to tell Yosef, he's asking, I'm sure, you know, who'd you marry? You know, what kids do you have? You know, I'm sure he's wanting the family news. Uh, yes, the reunion and the family news. So sweet moments. We don't know what else was said, but that didn't come until he had kissed them, until he had shown them complete forgiveness. He had broken down every wall of fear that they had and that shame, because remember they were carrying the shame. He just, they have found grace. They have definitely found grace. So he sent him off. That's what they're to do. And what's happening in Egypt in verse 16? Now when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house, and remember we saw earlier back up that the news went down to them. I should have looked before. Um, oh, goodness. Where is it? It's right here in this chapter. I'm trying to scan it very quickly. Um, I like the idea that you know, Pharaoh yeah. really loved uh, Joseph, yeah, Amen. yeah. Verse eight, tell us he's made me a father to fear on the Lord uh, of all his household. No, 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 that's not it. There is somewhere where we got the idea, but here's where I'm bringing it home. And yes, yes, Pharaoh, Pharaoh respected Joseph and what he did for them. Um, that's why he gave him everything that he could. You know, he he had a, a good respect for him, and I'm sure Joseph was showing the kindness of the Lord toward him also. So Egypt is, the, they all rejoice over this union that uh, they've heard that Yosef's brothers have come. And also, let me remind you too, this Pharaoh is from a foreign land. Remember, he's the Hyksos, H-Y-K-S-O-S. And the Hyksos were desert nomadic people. They were more, um, I'm going to say more closely related to Israeli people than they were to the Egyptians. You know, the Egyptians abhorred the shepherds. They abhorred that lifestyle. The Hicks's lifestyle was more compatible. So remember, it was easier for them to favor Yosef and to bring him into that position and trust him in that position. And here we see that again, that, that uh, there's a kinship. Might be stretching a little too far because they're not kin, but close relation. You know, they, they can just, it's a people they could relate to better. So it pleased Pharaoh. Um, Egypt is rejoicing. And when Yeshua is reconciled with his brethren, with Israel, the world will rejoice also. Because that will happen at the end of the tribulation, the starting of the millennium, when all the nations come up to Israel, come up to the temple to worship the Lord and be blessed also. So that will be our number 84, how y Yosef and Yeshua can be compared again. That when he's finally revealed to his brothers, there and there's reconciliation, then the whole world will enter into the blessing and the joy. Again, a beautiful picture. So verses 17 through 20 are going to show us the appreciation that Pharaoh had for Yosef. You know, he really was the man of the hour. He saved the nation of Egypt. He saved them from what was coming, that had they not had him in position, to know what to do in those seven years of plenty, they wouldn't make it through the seven years of famine. So they're very much appreciative, and that's what we're seeing in here. Pharaoh said in verse 17 to Yosef, Say to your brothers, do this. Load your beasts and go to the land of Canaan. Take your father and your households and come to me, and I'll give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you'll eat of the fat of the land. I'm going to read it all and then come back and break it down. Now you're ordered. Do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Do not concern yourself with your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. So what are we seeing in all of this? Wow, we are seeing a lot. Pharaoh is saying, hey, I'll roll out the red carpet for your family. You're, you've got connection with your family? Bring them. Come on, bring them. We'll give them the best because he's wanting to show his appreciation to Yosef. He's very, very thankful. So when it says, um, don't, you know, load your beasts and go. Take what you've got. Go to Canaan. Go back and get them. 
but take for them also. Tell them they're going to come get to the best of Egypt. They're going to eat the fat of the land. That's the best of the land. We'll, we'll feed them well. We'll, you know, they'll, they'll be able to produce here. Um, they're going to lack for nothing. Let me stop right there for a moment and also say, or maybe, no, it's in the next, yeah, it's in this verse. Take your father and your households. That's a picture of the household of Israel all being sent for and regathering into Israel. So even though this is going to happen in, is in Egypt, we have a picture of what's going to happen because at the time of millennium, at the end of the battle of Armageddon, the, the scripture says that the Lord sends his, four, his angels out to the four corners of the world to gather the Jews together and to bring them all home. All the Jews that have not made it home by then are being brought home. And that's what we're seeing here. <clears throat> You have to see it symbolically because Egypt's not the home, but this is where God is bringing them. Let me show you the verses for Israel, though, and that's Yeshua, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 66. I love this chapter. It's a nation being born in a day, and that is miraculous, and it has happened. There we go. My tablet's not cooperating. Okay, it really isn't. There we go. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Okay, Isaiah 66, 7 and 8 talks about the nation being born in a day. That's the reborn nation of Israel. But we're looking at um, 66 verse 20. And in verse 20 we read there, then, the, then they shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord, on horses, in chariots, in litters, or on mules, and on camels. To my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. So what we're seeing in that, again, is all coming to bring an offering to the Lord. Where do you give the Lord his offering? In the temple. Where's the temple? In Jerusalem. Bigger, rebuilt, well, not rebuilt, new, brand new, the, the built temple of Hezekiel, Ezekiel, from chapters 40 on through 48. This is the millennial temple. This is the fourth temple. It's not the third in the tribulation, the one that the, the Antichrist destroys. This is the one that is built after by the Lord who fills the whole, not just the holy holies, he fills the whole temple with his presence and his glory. But notice how it's saying they're coming on chariots and litters and mules. Well, Egypt is saying, take our wagons. Why do they need wagons? Because, exactly, put the little ones in the wagon and let them ride. They're not going to be able to keep up and, and you know, walk miles in a hurry. Right, right. So he's making it as easy on them as, as possible. And he's respecting the wives also. You don't often see that for the women folk in in different times of different cultures. But here, uh, Pharaoh is even saying for the wives, for the, the, the little ones, and don't worry about, you're not, I'm not sending you wagons so that you can pack up everything you've got there. Leave it all behind. I'm going to give you everything you need down here. So you get to move without packing. Who wants that? <laughs> I'll tell you, we all do get to move one day straight up without any packing. <laughs> and I love it. Okay, so he's he's providing for them. Look also, before we go back to, to uh, Beersheet, go to Yeshayahu chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, our prophet, same prophet, verses 11 and 12. And here we read in Isaiah 11, 11 and 12, Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand, the remnant of his people, who will remain. Okay, God's bringing his remnant together. God always keeps a remnant. There's never the end of the Jewish line. Even when Mark Twain went through Israel and said the whole land is denuded, there were still there's still a remnant that was living in that land. There's still Jews that were living elsewhere. And here they're going to come from Assyria, Egypt, Hathras, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamuk, and from the islands of the sea. These are all areas surrounding, you know, it, they're, they're maybe not as far away as the United States, but the point is that was the land known then, and they were scattered then. We're seeing that God's saying from the four corners of the earth, I'm bringing them back. Um, and he will lift up a standard for the nations, Assemble the banished ones of Israel. will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Okay, that's where I got that expression. You just have to say that, that different people still keep thinking that the world is flat because they could, just based on that part, not realizing that science and everything else afterwards did find out it's round. 
And but they keep going back to those scriptures in world splat. Like yeah, no, 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 no. And, and uh, Isaiah also refers to the circumference of the world. And a circumference is a circle. It is round. I am told if you get out into space, you can see what would be like four corners. I don't know how to explain that scientifically, but I'm told they can see and allude to that. You know, and it's not meant that it's this sharp corner, you know. That, that's our little peon brain again. <laughs> but uh, it was even the mappers that helped Columbus discover America because they were Jewish mappers and had looked at the scriptures and yeah. knew they weren't going to sail off the end, and that was it. They were going to be able to but keep they, it. Also, they also said, and I'm not sure, there was one before him that discovered America. So that's where it's confusing. Yeah. Well... We're not here to argue that point today. Oh, no, no. I, I'll tell you, um, people also don't want to recognize it. I mean, we have no problem with it, but I fully yeah. believe Christopher Columbus was himself a Jewish believer. I believe there's evidence of it in his diary. I so, know he's a Jewish believer. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nothing that you can say, here's the birth certificate, and it says that the, the comments and all in the diary, the fact that he had Jewish mappers, the fact that they got on the ship and sat Shiva on the 9th of Av, which is the day that they mourned the destruction of the first and second temple and so many other things happened in history, it all lines up. Why is he doing all these things if he's not Jewish? And then we do have the, the um, coded comments in the diaries that showed he was a believer. And I believe he was using the scriptures. I believe God was leading. God was bringing him. So I know who I think found in this area. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so I've told you the fathers and the households. I'm back in bare sheet. I think I'm ready for verse 19. Um, I've told you to bring your father and your household. That the you know the households. That's all the families. You know that's what it's meaning by by that reference by that word. Come to me, I'll give you the best in Egypt. You'll eat the fat of the land. Now you're ordered. Do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt. We've really talked about that. But look at how Pharaoh's saying it. He's ordering it because he wants them to do this. You know, don't let them waffle. Tell them it's an order. Order from headquarters. And, <laughs> and by the way, those carts would have been two wheels drawn by oxen or horses. And it's the first mention of that in the Bible. It, it could be that that was unique to Egypt that they had these wagons that would pull. You know, we see it today, we know, you know, much more since, but the first mention of it in the Bible in that way. So, interesting. Yeah. And so it's like the chariots, how they already have chariots. Like right, right. And we know the Egyptian army that was drowned, you know, of course that's coming. But we know then they were using chariots and, and all of that. But this does seem to be unique to Egypt, and of course this is prior to yeah. The crossing of the Red Sea that won't come till 400 years later. So. Well, because before, I, I mean, they, they used the camels to load them up. They never had anything to. Yeah, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. you know, but. Uh, the camels were always around. Yes, 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 but they, you know, things developed, you and here's that first mention. The resources they had, and they had the wood to be that, or whatever. Whereas Egypt had the resources. Build and make true, parts. true, and and were they wooden? Could have been. Yes. There's also the iron that was used that they knew how to do. Yes. Yeah. And Egypt was very advanced. We know because yeah. of the pyramids and and so forth. There are things that Egypt could do that I'm told we still can't do. Interesting. Okay. So we're ready for verse 20. And I think really I've said it too, don't be concerned for, you know, bringing your possessions, what's left behind. Um, the Hebrew saying, you know, that I'll give you the best. And they would have everything they needed supplied for them to, in Egypt. It was as big of a generous offer as Pharaoh could get. He was really giving them everything that he could because he had such gratitude for Yosef. You know, so, and, and rightfully so. Well, I think his brothers envied that a little bit. They well, I think there was testing that to see how they would be. Um, and, and yes, we'll come into that now. Verse 21, the sons of Israel did so. Yosef gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh. So they're getting sent home now with wagons. Even that's going to impress Jacob. He's going to realize something, you know, how did you come back with all of this? 
you know, I, I had to let you take Benjamin down there because you feared the wrath of this ruler who said, you know, you don't come back without him or you're going to all be thrown in prison because you're all spies. You know, now all of a sudden you're coming back with blessings, you know, with all of this. It would be so amazing. So Yosef gave him the, the wagons according to the command of Pharaoh, gave them the provisions for the journey, everything that they needed to go on their way. He provided for them. I just think it's interesting how, like, what was in the heart of Joseph to bless them, you know, is what God put in the heart of Pharaoh. Pharaoh. And he just didn't even have to argue with the Pharaoh to give them the stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. Look at that heart. Now compare that to the Pharaoh that came up by Moshe's time when it said, you know, that they were of a different... They weren't the Hicksus anymore. There was a change, and when that change came in, that heart wasn't there. And that Pharaoh, look at how his heart was against the people. So, yes, but everything that was in Yosef's heart, yes, you can see how God put it on Pharaoh also. And here's where we get now at what uh, Shell brought out for us earlier. To each of them he gave changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. Five is the number of grace. We see that grace. And this, these garments would have been Egyptian clothing for special occasions. He's dressing them up. He's bringing them down. He's saying, let me bring you down in splendor. Let me give you a, a new outfit for traveling in. You know, he's, he's just blessing with everything he could think of. Uh, very different you know, for them. And then to his father, he said, as follows, 10 donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and sustenance for his father on the journey. So Pharaoh's thinking ahead and saying, I'm going to load up 10 donkeys. I'm going to load up enough to carry all this home for you, all the, the goods, the grain, the food, everything I want you to have. But I'm also going to give you the females that reproduce. This is going to go on. This isn't a one-time gift. I'm going to see to it. You're going to keep getting blessed. And this is enough to carry you and to bring you down into the land. So he's he's doing all, like we said, he's doing all that he can. Um, the, the sons of Israel, they receive transportation, provision, garments, riches. And to return with these carts from Egypt, one of my sources said, and I love it, it was the equivalent of landing a jumbo jet among a tribe of isolated savages. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Whew, you know, from nothing to everything. And that, that would be the stuff that legends are made of, that here is fact, here is Number truth. 24. That's the where we're starting. One? We're at the start of it. Yeah, uh, is he a threat in him? Well, let's, let's read it, and then I'll answer that. So he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, Do not quarrel on the journey. Or you might have, do not fall out. Fall not out on the journey. Okay? Yosef knows his brothers. They're going to get away, and they're going to be absorbing and thinking and all this. And they've got to tell you know, their father something. And they know Joseph knows something. And he can see them. They're going to start fighting. Well, it was more your fault. You're the one who said you started, you instigated, but you fall. And he knew, you know, they could go at each other's throats. You ever seen siblings? Nope. Cousins. <laughs> Cousins. Yeah. Okay. This is not abnormal probably for almost any family. This would be very normal. And especially in regard to they're still going to want to shrug off that that fault. Whose fault is it? Who, and what does everyone love to do? Not pass me. The, pass the buck. Yeah, yes. yes. Not me. I didn't, you know, I just followed along. Oh, I was out there. Oh, you're the older one. You should have known better. You, know, you can hear it all. And he's saying, there's no time for that. Don't go into that. Don't go after each other. Don't get sidetracked. Just get on this journey go and come back. That's what he's saying in this verse. So he's just um, not reprimanding them, but he's he's trying advising to them? Uh, giving them advice or uh, yeah, advising them just a word of trust. Just trust. Yeah, just just I think just he's giving them a peace in mind. The past is gone. That's just going yeah. to be the end. Right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. So. 
he sent his brothers away and they departed and as they departed he said oh no I read that I'm sorry verse 25 then they went up from Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Yaakov gotta be thinking gotta be thinking what's he going to see and feel and think verse 26 and they told him saying Yosef is still alive and indeed he's ruler over all the land of Egypt now I want to stop there for a moment either part of that sentence is what <laughs> it's, you're telling me he's alive let me swallow that and, and, and absorb that and understand that before I can even begin to comprehend he's what <laughs> he's a ruler where in Egypt absolutely mind blowing to Yaakov to Jacob more than he could have ever I think in he any dream had hoped for no no he didn't he was stunned for he did not believe that yes and you know that's definitely that time again when your mind's gonna say that's just too good to be true I gave him up for dead 22 years ago and you're telling me he's not only not dead he's a ruler in a foreign land and he's blessing us with all this and he wants me to come wow wow you know that was enough shock yeah you wonder if the heart could take it also when all the entourage is coming up yes he had to have seen all the exactly exactly what is going on you know what is going on because all the good stuff they need yes 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 right right and who knows we can read and look into it any way we want we'll ask one day but as they were approaching where his dad would be did Benjamin run ahead dad dad guess what <laughs> I'm back I'm safe but that's not the news you know I don't know who really broke the news we're not I told but and I have a feeling they might have all been tripping on top of each other because they wanted to be the ones <laughs> Unless they were so afraid of how to explain, and I have then, no idea what they were going to yeah, do with that Benjamin part. Benjamin was the one that. that you, you think Benjamin got to? So Benjamin was <laughs> that really, really young when this happened. When Joseph. He was probably. Got, the uh, got rid of Joseph. Yeah, yeah. When 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 Joseph was taken, he was seventeen. Yeah, so so was his seven, brother seven, was the minimum of six years. Could have been yeah. ten years between them. So yeah. So. Um, he's in his early 20s now probably and he's grown up just hearing about his brother not really knowing his brother but, but then um, the reason I'm saying that is because they would push Bingham ahead so dad wouldn't be as mad and he would well they knew the fear he needed yeah, to yeah. see that Benjamin was with them that Benjamin was coming home safely yeah. you know and then he cared about uh, Shimon the one who was put in prison also so maybe he was second you know I don't know I don't know and how far could you see ahead too maybe he could just see them all and you know they're all spilling it out at the same time it's just fun to think but he was in Hebrew he froze I love that he just Froze. I think we can all relate to that. So stunned, he became numb. <laughs> but the Hebrew really says it. Um, uh, sometimes an interlinear, which is close, it says he stood still. I think he was just, you know, he, he couldn't move, he couldn't talk, he just had to try to process this. And he finally processes it. But, you know, the sad thing is, Israel has believed that Yeshua, Jesus, is dead all of these centuries mm -hmm. and yet he's not another way that there's a yeah. comparison between 85. Israel like this is number 85 yes between I'm sorry not Israel between Yosef and Yeshua that the you know that these all of Israel so to speak yeah. believe that Yeshua was dead that it ended <coughs> right there and it didn't it didn't so when they told him, verse 27, all the words of Yosef, remember he kept telling him, tell him this, tell him that, tell him you heard me, tell him you saw me, tell him you, it came right out of my mouth. It's not hearsay, it's not hope, so this is reality. So when they told him all the words that Yosef had spoken to them, and when he saw living proof, like we've said, he saw the wagons that Yosef had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father, Yaakov, revived. He got his breath. 
Wow, okay, he can start moving and talking and all of that, okay? Now, I have a feeling, and I'm just reading between lines, this is my opinion, but I have a feeling they did not tell his dad that they were the ones who sold him down to Egypt. I have a feeling that they're hiding that part, you know, they're not even, let's just, let's just enjoy the picture, let's not go into that. And dad was so happy he didn't care. Exactly, it didn't matter at all, and if Yosef's not going to spill the beans, maybe ya Yaakov will never never ask, you know, we'll never have to cross that, but really, you know, um, how would he have felt if he knew his sons had caused him that grief, and that he grieved for 20 years that they had, you know, did this, and, and all that came from it, it would have been, you know, I think we would hear something about it if it had happened, I, I just really think they just want to let that part go away. So he, Jacob never knew what they did, it doesn't seem it like doesn't it. doesn't seem like it in scripture, you know. He never said anything, and he was just, you know, Yeah, yeah, and he was just too busy being, being revived, being, being brought back to that life of my son is alive. And isn't that a picture for the revival in Israel? When the Son of Man has come and stopped that battle of Armageddon, and when he's setting up Israel in that kingdom that has been promised all the way back through time for them, and they're finally realizing who he is and that they're in his midst and receiving his blessings. Today Israel is the dry bones, Hezekiel, Ezekiel 37. Back in the land, but the Spirit of God is not in them. There's, there's just, you know, the flesh covering. But, well, let's read it. Let's go to Hezekiel because uh, it, there's a question asked there. And uh, we see this in the, re, um, the revival of Yaakov, even, that revived spirit. In Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37, let's read verses 7 and 8. So I prophesied as I was commanded. This, this is Ezekiel speaking. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. Behold me, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. He'd seen all this, this graveyard of dead bones, skeletons. Verse 9, And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So first you see all these dead bones. Now he's seeing skin. He's seeing, you know, like a, a human body there, but there's no breath. They're not breathing. They're not living. That's what he's seeing in verses 7 and 8. And then um, the question it asked is, can, can they, they come to life? Can they breathe again? You know, what, what's going on here? In verse 11, we start to have the picture explained. Then he said to me, and this is the, the um, who is it called in here? Um, it's just saying the Lord. So I, I'm just going to say the Lord speaking to him, yeah. to Ezekiel. Son of man, and this is not the Messianic title, this is the small m. He's saying it to the human called Hezekiel, Ezekiel. These bones are the whole house of Israel. He's saying they're a picture of Israel. Israel's just a bunch of dead bones. But they say our bones are dried up, our hope is perished, we're completely cut off. That's how they were feeling, especially before they had their land back. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. We begin to see that. We begin to see that first fruits. We'll see the greater picture in the future. Then you will know I am the Lord when I've opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. What a beautiful picture that was given to Hezekiel. We've seen a, a beginning, but now take that. Take it to the tribulation time that I talked about earlier, prefaced it, I think, before we started recording. The time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Yaakov's trouble, another name for the tribulation, Zechariah and other prophets telling how many will lose their lives during that time. Mm -hmm. Third of the city destroyed, another third of the city destroyed. All that falls, read the book of Revelation, so much devastation, so much destruction, like a graveyard of, of dead bones and wondering, can, can they ever come to life again? 
You know, right now Israel's in a very, very tight spot. She's got war on the, the, the south. She's got war looming in the north. She's got her side bleeding. She's got attacks coming in every direction. Right now her major number one friend in this world is backing up. I pray to God we do not do that completely. No. I also pray that we silence our mouths because that empowers the enemy when they think that we're not going to be there to support. But all of this happening, and this Let honestly... Let them fight their own war how they want. Yeah, exactly, because they're there. The audacity that we think sitting in the comfort of our living rooms I can tell enough, Israel we've how... We've been in other countries, wars and situations. And we've done real well there, too, haven't we? Anyway, I agree with all your comments. Yeah. Uh, but this that we're saying and seeing and how much this is grieving us, take that into the tribulation time. Take that into... All of those bowls of wrath that are poured out, all of those, um, those, uh, the constant, I can't think of the word I want, Soros is my Hebrew, the trials, the troubles, everything that's going to happen again and again and again, and its focal point is on this land, it's all, it's worldwide though, don't miss that. This is not God saying, oh, I'm going to spank Israel and you're, you know, no, this is God pouring his wrath out on the world and in it. His hand of mercy is going to bring Israel to open her eyes and seek her God again so that he can deliver her the same way he sent Moshe to deliver her out of slavery. She's in the slavery again in this. What a horrible, horrible picture of what Ezekiel was seeing. And yet what a beautiful picture in this reviving of Yaakov. We see the reviving of Israel. We see Israel coming back to life. We see the promises and we see that the God who is faithful keeps his word. He keeps his word to a thousand generations. He keeps his word to Israel. He never replaced her. He never brought in another people and said, should this people get her promises? And by the way, all the people who claim that, they don't take any of the curses God promised on his people when they were disobedient. They just pull out the promises and say, oh, this is all ours, and, and Israel gets what they deserve. You never see God's heart like that. Never, never. And here he is finally bringing them back. And I think this joy that Yaakov is feeling and, and being just, all the blessings just being poured on him, I think it's almost more than, than he could absorb. And I think that's how Israel's going to feel. They have been hated for so long. And if you don't think they're hated, just turn on your news. Just turn on the news. Mm -hmm. It is worldwide right now. And it's, well, what's it matter? They're just Jews. What's it matter? Mm -hmm. That's what we heard in World War II. Yeah. That's the closest we can associate. And then to have it change, to have their Messiah and all the blessings poured out. Wow. Was that Praise God. Isaiah 66, yes. No, no, is that the number 86? Oh, you know, I didn't mark it down, but sure. Because it does. It's another, maybe I didn't because it's Jacob reviving. I think that's why I didn't, because so it's, it's Jacob 85. reviving. Part 85. Okay. Part of 85, yes. Yeah. Did I read it all? Did I go all the way through 14? Yes. Yes, okay. And by the way, for any who think this is already fulfilled, no, because notice those key words. You will know that I, the Lord, have done this. Um, you know, uh, you'll know that I, Lord, have spoken and done it. It's the end of verse 14. It's the same way I see in Ezekiel 38 and 39, that battle. When it says at the end of that battle, they, they will know, they will know, the world will know, the world will know. The world's never going to know that till it, it's actually happening. So, hallelujah. I think the interesting thing with, the, we were talking about the dry bones, mm -hmm. is in the hope of Israel is when they became, you know, a country again, and the national anthem is called... The hope, the hatikva, the hope, yes. Yes, good point, yes. And it definitely is like a, a, a smaller picture of the greater that will happen, absolutely, absolutely. And that was miraculous. And the fact that she not only was born in that day, but then survived the very next day when, when five or six, depending on how you look at it, Arab nations came against this little baby, trying to snuff her out before she's even, you know, past being an infant. And God said no. He put his miraculous hand. And against all odds, Israel is a nation. Against all odds, Yaakov's being reunited. He's coming down to Egypt now. Picture, though, of Israel in her home. 
and I think I'm ready to say it. Oh, no, I do want to bring out one other point that I was going to say, you know, hallelujah, let's go. <laughs> um, but in verse 28, back in, in Beersheet, in uh, Genesis 45, in verse 28, we haven't gotten his response here at this point. We said his spirit revived. But verse 28, then Israel said, it is enough. My, Yosef, my son Yosef is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. I don't need anything else. My heart's full. I've got my son. Hallelujah. I heard one of the hostages, that, that the four that they just released, I heard the mom of one of the four when she was being interviewed right after, before there actually had been the, the actual reunion. No, I think, I think they had. I think she was, they had that short reunion, and at the hospital she was being interviewed. And she said, you know, Tomorrow's my birthday. I got my gift. I don't need anything else. She was just so wrapped up in, in having her son back. That's all that mattered. Yaakov is feeling that way. But notice a key change. Notice he hasn't been called Jacob here. He's been called Israel. His faith revived again. We see the name change. Jacob is now Israel again. Remember when we see Jacob, often we're seeing the flesh and when we see the name Israel, we're often seeing the spiritual. So that name's given to him as conquer. We're conquerors when we're in the Lord. And we see that the name was given to him all the way back in chapter 32. And the Genesis in verse 28. Just take you back there for a quick moment because that was so long ago when we were there. Sorry, say again, Genesis what? 32. It's supposed to be 32, verse 28. Genesis 32 and verse 28. This is when Yaakov is wrestling with the angel Lord all night long. And then he, all that the angel does is touch him in the hall of his thigh. It's dislocated, battles all over. And Yaakov is realizing that, you know, this is the Lord. Who am I to think I can wrestle against the Lord? I can't fight against him. But, exactly, you can wrestle all you want, but you're not going to win. So, but I love what he does next. He throws his arms around him, and I'm not going to let go until you bless me. <laughs> he clings to him. And that's where we get the name change in verse 28. Your name so, shall no longer be Yaakov, Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And Israel, that, when you break that down in the root, you have everything from ruling with God to the warrior who fights with God. We see the victory. We see that it's God rules because L is God so you can see so much in it I should have thought that could have brought us but if, go back to my chapter 32 when he got the name and I gave you that breakdown of, of the name Israel so much more in it so many different meanings given to it but they're all there in the root you know so we we can see multiple meanings uh, but what I see is so beautiful that in in the spiritual is where the victory came and for us the battle can be fierce we may feel like we're those dead bones. But look, the victory comes in the spirit. The victory comes in the spiritual. The victory comes when you cling to the Lord. Don't say, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Instead, ask the Lord to bless you through it, to bring you through it, to bring you into that place of victory because that's our faithful God. And Yaakov's faith in God, the God of Israel, overcame his grief. It was greater than all he had suffered, mourning the loss of his son for 20 plus years. And we know he was still mourning him because remember he said, if I lose Benjamin too, that's just too much. You know, I could never recover from that. He had thought it was going to take him down to the grave when he lost Yosef, and he was sure it would if he lost Benjamin also. That God in his faithfulness is bringing him, growing him through that journey. Why do we go through trials and tribulations? Where we grow it's where we learn it's where you understand the grace of our god and his faithfulness yes yes i thought it would already come to those three reasons that you gave cheryl i know it's going to come up because it's it sounded exactly like what the lord led me into in my notes and we must be still coming to it but i'm glad you brought it out when you did god's grace and uh his everything even even you can even look at the garments he clothes us in his righteousness hallelujah so 
let's get to Beersheba. Let's get to bringing Jacob. I guess we actually got there. He is there. Okay. At verse 46, we're going to set out and we're going to get all the way back. Oh, no, no, no. He wasn't at Beersheba. He was nearby. That's my problem why I put that down. Sorry, folks. Need to remember better in my little brain. But in verse 1 of chapter 46, what we're seeing is then, so Israel set out. Okay, remember, he's in the spiritual now. He's being the spiritual leader. He's in the, the good place spiritually. So he's got, he's carrying that name. So Israel set out with all that he had. And I think that was his family. It wasn't that they packed up every household good because remember, they were told they didn't need to. But he set out with what, what they needed. And they came to Beersheba. Okay, so they've gone from Hebron to Beersheba. That's not real far, but they've started out. Now, let me remind you, and I should have told you, just jump with me to several places in uh, Genesis right now. Um, we're going to go back to chapter 37 because I want to remind you the significance and importance of Beersheba. Genesis 37 and verse 14. We have there, um, okay, this is where, I could have just told you this one. This is where uh, Joseph is sent to go check on his brothers and see how his brothers are doing. Um, his father said to him, verse 14, go now, see about the welfare of your brothers, the welfare of the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Okay, so he's on that, that travel. Now, Beersheba is where we see, and you know, right, we're right in that area that we're talking about, leaving Hebron, going toward Beersheba, that's where we see in chapter 21 and verse 33 that something very special happened with Abraham here. Chapter 21 of Genesis. I have a, a question thought. Yes. Um, it says that he offered sacrifices to God and his father, so... Uh, Did I forget to read that in 37? No, uh, 46 verse 1. Okay, yes. Yeah. Sorry, 46. So, or less than jumping again, I'm sorry. But then I mean... That's okay. I love enthusiasm. Um, so he, he was probably had built an up there under Joseph, and his, that's where he sent him, where he was supposed to be dead. So now he's building an offering, saying th a thanks offering. He stopped long enough to give a thanks offering now that Joseph is alive. Okay, and it is definitely the thank offering, but let's go back and look at why Beersheba. Okay, because that we've got to get the history of Beersheba back into our minds. So in chapter 21 and verse 33 with Avraham, Avraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Avraham sojourned in the land of the Philistines for many days. So when he came to Beersheba, this is where he stopped. He dug the seven wells. He's given all the glory to the Lord, and he made an altar to the Lord here. He worshiped the Lord in Beersheba. So on the way to chapter 21. Okay, with Abraham, chapter 21 with Abraham, okay? Now, Abraham's son Isaac in chapter 26, go past 21, go to chapter 26, we're going to see what Isaac has to do with this area also. Verse 23, chapter 26 and verse 23, then he went up from there to Beersheba. Okay, so Isaac left where he was at. He goes to Beersheba. This is all when they're, they're fighting over all those wells. But what happens to Isaac at Beersheba? Verse 24, the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I'm the God of your father, Abraham. Remember, God met Abraham at Beersheba. Now God's meeting Yitzhak there. And he's saying, do not fear, for I'm with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. I promised it to Abraham. I'm going to do it, Yitzhak. No worries. And the Lord's meeting him right there in Beersheba, in a very special place. So what does Isaac, Yitzhak, do? Verse 25. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, pitched his tent there, and Isaac's servants dug a well. Okay, and he ends up digging more than one well. But here we have very obviously, Abraham offered, or made, you know, sacrifice to the Lord of Beersheba. Yitzhak it's um, called on by the name of the Lord and builds an altar there before the Lord to honor the Lord there. And so when we see that, now we've got grandson. We've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's following in the footsteps of his 
spiritual leaders. He's realizing this is a special place and he, I think, stopped there on purpose. He is setting out in joy. He is so excited to go that, wait a minute, I gotta stop, I've gotta honor my Lord, I need to give a thanks offering to the Lord, and then we'll continue our journey. Okay, um, what's the significance of this tree that Abraham first planted there? When we talked about it back then, um, it was, because I know they, as you go in the Bible, they go back to that same place, and I don't remember, somebody buried something under this tree or something, whatever. Near so there, has, yeah. It just seems to have been a landmark, an area where, where you know, that probably was even a lodging place built near here. Um, because it just from the wording, it sounds like that, and it was a, a place to stop on the way for refreshment. Because it's visited quite often. Right. And we're looking at it because spiritually they seem to keep coming back here, keep coming back here, keep coming back here. And remember, they're not dealing as we are with the Spirit of God within them. You know, this is the time when the Spirit of God comes on them, leaves them. They, you know, fulfill the work that they're supposed to do. But it's not the same that we feel like we're taking the Lord with us. They're feeling like, well, look at, look at Yaakov. Look at his dream. That says that I think best. When he woke up from the, the dream, the ladder, and it's not Jack and the Beanstalk, okay, <laughs> no relation. This this was the ladder that did go right into heaven. He saw Yeshua at the top of the ladder. The ladder represents the work of Yeshua in salvation for us. It's beautiful. That's a whole other study, Yaakov, and, and you know, I, I call it whose ladder is it anyway? You know, is it really Jacob's or is it Yeshua's? It's Yeshua's. But when he saw that and he awakened from that dream, and this was when he's being sent out, you know, his brother wants to kill him. He's on the run in essence. And, you know, he's three days also, if I remember correctly, and I'm sure I do. Notice the third day for those of you who are with me in that study. Three days out and here in this dream, putting his head down, you know, on, on a, a rock because he's sleeping outside. And yet when he awakened and then realized he said, this is the gate to heaven. This this is, you know, you could rocket launch from right here to heaven. That's how he saw it. And he called the name of the place Bethel, house of God, Bethel. So it's that same idea at Beersheba. They felt the spirit of the Lord. They they had connection with the Lord. The Lord I can just hear Yaakov saying, the Lord showed up to my dad, Yitzhak, and he built an altar there. I want to go worship my Lord there. And so he goes there. So I don't remember there being a significance for the tree other than it's the landmark and the place and the area, you know, that they were talking about. It would have been on the thoroughfare that they were traveling. Now, there may have been more. I need to go back to my notes. I'm just going to suppose since sure. you said it, it's a tree of refreshment. Yes. Jesus is the tree of life. Absolutely. We can draw that spiritual, yes, absolutely. Yes. And are we to be like a tree planted by the river who's whose roots go down deep so that we are not, uh, we have green leaf and drought time. I just massacred that one too today. But you all I think know what I'm trying to say. I will go back to my my notes. I wish I retained everything I teach. That's why I have to have notes in front of me. If I remember more, I'll bring it back out next week. Okay, but, uh, but the main point is this was a place to stop and honor the Lord and worship the Lord. Then go and enjoy. And I love you. Put that first. You have to turn that off. It's burning my eyes. Uh, Roger, can you turn the fan off for Loretta? And if it, it's hard to read. It if we need burn. more house air because it gets too warm back there, let me know. You know, just I know get the idea. We can feel the air conditioner, but that is, is is really burning my eyes. Yeah, he'll get it for you. Thank you, Roger. So we'll go back to chapter forty-six. We'll go back to um, Yaakov. Now, where he is at Beersheba, he's stopping on his way down, and he does it for that sole purpose. He came to Beersheba, offered sacrifices, and notice how it even says, to the God of his father, Yitzhak. So I'm sure he's recalling and saying, hey, you know, this, this is a special place. This is where I want to honor the Lord. But now I'm going to ask you something else, too. I'm going to say maybe... Just maybe there's something else going on in Yaakov's mind right now. Okay? 
maybe there's a little concern. This all is wonderful. It looks wonderful. But God, aren't I supposed to stay in Israel? What am I doing going down to Egypt? You know, is this really the right thing? So perhaps he's wanting to stop at the altar of sacrifice and have a time with God to get before God, give him that sacrifice to show his heart and where he's at. I'm putting you first, God. I think that I'm being led, but is it right? Because you directed us to the land. You didn't direct us to Egypt, okay? Look at chapter 31 and verse 3. Well, verse 2, chapter 31. Chapter 31. 31. I'm taking you back, okay? Chapter 31 and verse 2. Am I in the right? Sorry, 31 verse 3. <laughs> this is, Yaakov's about ready to leave Padan Aram. He's got his wives. Levon is coming against him. He's saying, you know what, girls, it's time. I need to go home. I've been gone for 20 years. I need to go home. Okay, because he worked seven years for each of the wives, and then he was there, you know, on, until um, Yosef had been born. Anyway, verse 3. Then the Lord said to Yaakov, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. And we know that God took him all the way back, got him home safely. Now, God had let him go to Padan Aram, but God was bringing him back home. Look at chapter 35, okay? In chapter 35, in verse 1, we have then God said to Yaakov, Arise, go up to Bethel, and live there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Remember, he had settled. He was not he was in the area of Shechem. He hadn't gone all the way back to where he had started from. And he was there for a number of years. It took the, the chapter of Dina being raped and the brothers defending her for them to get out of Dodge. They kind of, you know, oh, you know, the rest of Shechem's going to be so mad at us that we better move, okay? So all that's behind that history here, but then look at verses 9 through 12, okay, of chapter 35 in Genesis. And verse 9 says, Then God appeared to Yaakov again when he came from Padan Aram, and he blessed him. That's at Beit El, okay? God said to him, Your name is Yaakov. You shall no longer be called Yaakov, but Israel shall be your name. Because this is that spiritual turn in him. Thus he called him Israel. And God said, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, a company nation shall come from you, and kings shall come from you. So all of this, oh, let me read verse 12. The land, in fact, I have to read verse 12. That's my whole point. The land which I gave to Abraham and Yitzhak, I will give it to you. This is where Yaakov was promised the land. Abraham was promised it to his descendants. Isaac, being one of his descendants, God said, I, here it is, Isaac, I've promised it to you. Not to Ishmael, but to you. Now we've got Yaakov, and God saying, it is your Yaakov. Not Esau, not Ishmael, not any others. It's for you, Yaakov. This is his, put down the, the marker, you know, put the stake down and claim it. This is yours. This is the land I gave to Abraham and Yitzhak. I will give it to you and I will give the land to your descendants after you. So that means, Yaakov, you've had 12 sons. Those are your descendants. This land is theirs. When they have children, those are your descendants. This land is theirs. And the line goes down. So Yaakov has all this in his mind. He's held this in his heart. He's seeing it unfold. He's back in the land where he belongs when he comes back after you know getting his wives and he comes back and he's settled there and he's raised his children there of course some of them were older but you know he's all along and they've had families and they've got kids so all of a sudden i think the reality is hitting yako i'm pulling up stakes from where god said this is the land i gave you and i'm going to egypt hmm there was doubt I think there sure. was a little bit of doubt. Okay. I think that, you know, in all the emotion, all of the excitement, they're taken up, and then reality's hitting. And he is thinking, and he wants to know, because remember, he's in that spiritual place now. He's been called Israel. Mm -hmm. He wants to know, I'm following you, God. You're leading me down to Egypt. I don't understand that. 
that as long as I know you're leading me, then I'm good. I'll go. <laughs> you know? But I think there was. I think that, that there was just a bit of uneasiness there in leaving the land of promise to go down to another place to be taken care of. So I'm going to say about Yaakov that his life in Haran typified the man of God living in the flesh. And in his life in Canaan, it typified the man of God fighting in his own strength. His life in Egypt is going to typify the man of God that's walking by faith and not by sight. That even if God leads him to something he doesn't understand in a different place, he's going to trust and walk with his God. Okay, so say it one more time. Herba was man of his flesh. And then in Canaan, Canaan, he's the man of God fighting in his own strength. You know, we have the battle, we have the, the fight with the angel of the Lord and so forth. But his willingness to go down and live life in Egypt is now the walk of faith. That, you know, I hear Psalm 23, though, though, you know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know, we don't know where the Lord is taking us. Mm -hmm. But he was willing to say, okay, I don't understand because I think this is where I should be because it's called the land of promise and it's what you gave to me. But you reassure my heart, God, that I'm following you and I will do that. And that's what he does. Mm -hmm. And he does get to come back, but not in an alive state. Yeah. <laughs> but he does get to come back. He's obedient. And he yes. Yeah. Yes. And we get to that. I'm to the point now where I'm starting to deal with his, the, his death and I feel like I'm losing a friend. Mm -hmm. But just temporarily, I'll meet him one day. But, you know, just about to that point where he does make his son promise, I know my time is coming, promise me you'll bury me in Israel. He wants, he wants to be in that land of promise that God gave to him and, and God honors that. But um, here back now in chapter 46, this is the seventh time you know, five, six, seven, this is the seventh time, and it's the last recorded time that we have where God met with Jacob. Okay, we've got God meeting in a very special way with Jacob seven times, including this one. I'll just give you the references. We've talked about a couple of them right here, that chapter 28 and verse 13, chapter 31 and verse 3, Chapter 32, verses 1, and then 24 and 30. And these are in your cross-references, by the way, if you get them from me. Um, chapter 35 and verse 11. And chapter 35, verse 9 also. Now, let me say what they are. I gave you the references. I'm going to let you look them up on your own. But in 2813, that's when he first set out for Padan Aram. That's when Esau wants to kill him, and he's going to go get his little wife. Okay? Now, when it was time to leave Padan Aram, that's 31.3. We just talked about that. God sent him, you know, it's time to go back. Then in chapter 32, the references I gave there, that's when he's about to meet Esau. And remember, he's a bit shaky. You know, I, I left my brother wanting to kill me. You know, now I'm coming back into his territory, and I don't know if I'm going to meet friend or foe. Okay, and the fourth time that God speaks to, to Yaakov is during that time. He speaks to him two different times in that episode of, of uh, meeting his brother again. Then the fifth time that God speaks with Yaakov is when the sons in chapter 35 killed off the, the Shechemites, the, the men of Shechem. Um, that was terrible. Yeah, yeah, and God spoke to him then. So the sixth time is when he finally returned to Bethel. To Bethel, that's what got him to leave Shechem, because you know they knew, okay, not good for us to be here. And really, Yaakov had been told, go all the way back home, go back to Bethel. That's what God told him to do when he left Padan Aram. Now he's finally doing it, and when he finally does get all the way back to Bethel, chapter thirty-five and verse nine, God speaks to him again. That's six times, and now the seventh time is right here in this chapter. I see, and I love to liken it to Fiddler on the Roof. If you don't know the, the theme, what is meant by a Fiddler on the Roof, who would fiddle on the roof? That's <laughs> precarious, that's dangerous, but that's what the Jewish life was being symbolically represented by, that our lives are as crazy as a Fiddler on the Roof. And if you watch the movie, every time when their lives really start getting shaken, 
that fiddler shows up. And in that final, when they're being sent out on the pogrom, they're being sent out of their land, they're carrying all their goods, and they're having to go and hope they can start again. Their intent in the, the story is to come to America, but it's there. They packed up everything. And in the movie, one of the last things, scenes you see, Tevye takes the mezuzah off of the door. The mezuzah is that little holder that has that bit of scripture that says, you're to teach to your children on the going out and on your coming in. You're to remember it. You're to pass it down to all your children. It comes right out of De Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. And he takes that. And in the respect that they always do, they either kiss their hand and then touch it or touch it and then kiss their hand. Just, just a reverence. Just showing respect. He kisses it and he's just tucked it into his pocket. Okay, you know, wherever we go, God, we'll take you with us and we'll teach our children. And then you hear the fiddler timidly, and he turns around, he sees the fiddler, and the fiddler's like, yeah, and Timmy's like, come on, we go. And I just love that symbolism. I think Yako, at this point, needed that. Life's a little precarious. Lord, I just need your assurance. Is this right? Oh, okay, let's go. And he sets his face for Egypt. Not where he thought he'd be going, not where he thought things would be ending up, but hey, I, my son's down there. I, I don't understand any of this. So in the number seven, we see the completion of inscription. So I see Yaakov's journey from Canaan back to Canaan. That's all been completed now. So now God is sending him a new chapter in his life down to Egypt. Again, God's purposes so different and his plan so perfect than what ours is. What's going on with the family in Israel right now? Only about 70 in number, and we're gonna talk about that number. Ooh, where did it go? Next week we'll get into the numbers and that goes pretty fast, so hang on, we'll start moving again. But there's so little in number right now. And they're, lin, 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 I think it's time to quit teaching. They're living in the land of Canaan and all around them, the Canaanites have all kinds of idolatry going on. Well, we know Esau took Canaanite wives. What do you think those children were being raised in? Not just in the pure God of Israel. It's being mixed. God's got to keep his godly line. Of course, God has no problem. He can keep his godly line. Don't read that the wrong way. But God knew, my little baby is in a bad neighborhood. My little baby is not doing what my baby should be doing. I want my baby to walk with me. I want my baby's eyes on me. I don't want my baby mixing with the world around it. And he's mourned, and they still keep mixing with the world around. You know, we, we know that, that it was not God's will that they intermarry, but they're doing it. And there's all this influence coming in. So God's saying, okay, then I'm gonna pick up my precious spiritual baby and I'm going to place her in another environment where she's not going to be mixing and intermarrying. Because remember how Egypt feels about shepherds, about those who work in the field? Ugh, we abhor you. We're not going to look at you like, oh, you're cute and I want to you know, have your child. No, they're going to live unto themselves. They're going to nurture their own faith, the faith in the God of Israel. They're going to nurture the traditions and laws and rulings that God's given them how to live a separate life. So they're going to go down into a place where they hold together, where the influences are further out. Remember, even own where they're worshiping the false god is a distance from them. God put them in a place all by themselves. Now, he did it with great blessing. It's the richest place. They can have their, their, be their, they have their shepherd life. They'll have food, they'll have everything they need. Everything's being supplied for them. That's what God does with us. Aren't we his precious babies? And sometimes for our own good, we can't see it, but he has to pick us up and put us somewhere and we're going, nah, nah, nah. Return of it. Zip that lip, look at the partial this week, the children of Israel complaining last week and this week, and I'll tell you, Zip your lips when you want to complain and, and look to your God instead. But God was allowing this for a reason because they're going to go from 70, and that's significant. They're going to go from 70 
to about two and a half million by the time they come out. It's going to take them 400 years. God's not in a hurry. I am sorry, God. I'm always in a hurry, and I want him to hurry up and do his plan. But God's going to take 400 years, and it's going to take them going from what's good to slavery. Wait a minute. I don't like this, God. This hurts. Mm -hmm. Now we're being persecuted. And when they finally cry out to their God, then he's able to bring in their deliverer and move them on. And that's what we're seeing again. So God had great reason in this. Yes, he's sending Yaakov down to Egypt. It was not a mistake. It was for the good of his whole family. And God in his faithfulness will keep them in Egypt. And then, as we'll see, when Yaakov says to, to Yosef down in Egypt, I know you're going back home. I know you're going to someday. Take my bones. <laughs> Don't leave them here. And we see that Yosef even goes up and, and buries him in Israel even before the children of Israel all move back to Israel sometime later. Because it's after, after Yosef, it's in Moshe's time, the Pharaoh that didn't know, um, didn't know the God of Israel, didn't know Israel, um, got at work, got at work, changing those circumstances and moving. What a plan. Whoa. And we think, God, what are you doing? Yes, sir. Okay, in, in the Bible it says uh, that, like you were saying, that they were mixing and stuff like that. And then it says, you told them, you have to leave your wife and your children. Um, what did he, what did they do to them? When did, they, them. when did they leave their wife and children? I'm lost. Um, okay. Huh? Back in the early, yeah. like he was asked the uh, back in, let me see, what is it? John Samuel, but yeah, Samuel, Esther, somewhere around Chronicles, it says that uh, God told them, you have been mixed and you have children with this, that, and the other. Esther, Esther? No, it's not Esther. When they, uh, they had married, you know, not Jewish or Israelites. I'm not recalling the time, but it has to be, if they're being told to leave family, it has to be a family that is in idolatry that will not come out. Because look at what God does with Lot. When Lot backslid, you know, he, he tries to get his family, um, whether those were sons-in-law or about to be sons-in-law, it doesn't matter, they were considered family, he tried to get them to go with him. And when they would not, then the angels that were there forced Lot and his wife and the daughters that were with them to go. And they had to leave behind others who would not go. So wherever you're thinking it has to be, any that were being left behind, that they were being told to leave, had it been so steeped in the idolatry that they would not turn to the God of Israel. And he was having to bring them out into their purity. And if you say, well, that's not fair, I had to leave them. Well, they should never have married them in the first place. They're suffering the consequences of actions that were not right before God. But their lives never be but, but, I mean, did it mean you just leave them, or do you get rid of them in, in what sense of the word? Um, I, do they get killed, or do they just take them it's, away? Leaving them sounds like like the spiritual person moved physically, and the others were left where they were. So it doesn't sound to me like death. It just sounds like, you know, separating. Yeah, separating. But uh, it, find me your scripture, and then I can go look at what the Hebrew is saying. <laughs> Um, I'll try to Google it. I'll see if I can get on that same page. Um, you, and you think it's somewhere like in the Chronicles. She's thinking Ezra, yeah. And see, that's after 70 years of captivity in Babylon that they're being, that they're going back to Jerusalem to rebuild Jerusalem. That's the backdrop for Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, so if it's in that time, Yes, even Daniel was grieved that so many didn't want to leave Babylon. That when the time of captivity was up, you know, they weren't, they weren't wanting to go back. They'd settled in. Life was good. So that's why God had to make them so miserable in Egypt, or allow them to be so miserable in Egypt, that they would finally want and go where they were supposed to go. Now I'll, I'll look for that and see if I can find that, and you wanted me the significance of the tree. 
I'll look up my notes on that too. But, uh, but God, God is not a separator of a family of love that's being obedient you know, to him. Even look at the time when he came down in judgment against Babel and they talked in different languages. They, they've been working side by side with somebody that suddenly they couldn't communicate with, but that wasn't their wife or their husband. I don't believe that God separated a family, that a husband and wife couldn't talk to each other anymore. I believe the families, you know, and, and you even see that. The cultures, you know, it's families that speak a language, you know. So I believe God separated uh, people, but, people but not families. That's why to leave wives and children had to be that they were totally idolatrous and would not would be, yeah. turn to the God of Israel. Yeah. And so um, that's the only thing I can think and say off the top of my head. I'm going to close in a real fast prayer. I know I've lost a couple in the last couple of moments for those who need to go, but that way then Roger can open up all the mics to all of you in Zoom room who have been very quiet. And remember, you're allowed to ask questions too, <laughs> but uh, we will open up. You can get into this conversation so that uh, you feel more apart. Okay, so Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the faithfulness of our God. We thank you for your perfect and magnanimous plan. Your ways are far above our ways and your thoughts and our thoughts. Lord, help us to be quick to trust you and slow to complain. <laughs> Zip our lips, Lord. May we realize even when we do not understand, you are working and you're working it all together for our good. Lord, we know that doesn't mean everything is good, but we thank you that you can even take evil, what one means for evil, and you can turn it for good in our lives. Let these words encourage the hearts of any who are struggling right now. May they see your faithfulness. May they feel your love just enveloping them. May they, in their concern for a, a future decision, may they know that they can trust, that you will reveal clearly, and that you will show yourself faithful to them. And as we desire, Lord, to follow only in your footsteps, may that be what we do. Again, as you did for the children of Israel, cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. Lord, thank you that even in the dark, you put the night light on. And we can see and follow all the way home. So we praise you and give you glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, open up their mics.